Hello everyone, particularly the boys and girls in the Breach Candy Hospital, nurses, doctors, etc. There has been a break in the snippets for unavoidable circumstances. And I'm going to start again, and this snippet is an interesting subject, at least to me. It's on war and myths. Medicine is as old as man and perhaps came into being with the opening of consciousness in humankind. War, I think, antedates all recorded history. It was certainly in prehistoric times, but it became much more evident with the growth rise of civilizations and above all with the establishment of countries having demarcated boundaries. Of the last 3,500 to 4,000 years, wars have pockmarked the history of man and medicine. War and medicine have a remarkable interrelationship. I think, perhaps, war is the greatest inhumanity perpetrated by man on his fellow man. War stands for death, destruction, suffering. Medicine is its opposite. It stands for the relief of suffering. For caring, for healing, it stands for life. So you have two opposites. Now when you compare medicine in relation to the treatment of the disease in a patient, what medicine does is just not relieve the symptoms, but it takes away the root cause of the disease. Well, when you compare war in relation to medicine or medicine in relation to war, the only way, only thing, only purpose that medicine serves is to mitigate the sufferings of war. That's all it can do. It cannot treat the root cause. It cannot abolish wars. Wars go on. Military medicine has been there from ancient times. The Peloponnesian Wars, I think fought in the 5th century before Christ, the Gallic Wars of Caesar, 2nd century before Christ, and all the numerous wars that followed right up to the present time. Amazingly, Homer in his Iliad says that the soldier at that time was his own physician. He knew which wounds would heal well. He knew which Places where the arrow hit were dangerous places for life. For example, an arrow in the windpipe, hitting the windpipe, was often associated with death, as also an arrow in the forehead, as also an arrow that penetrated the heart. And they make a note that if you plucked an arrow which was within the heart, the man would die instantly because he would bleed to death. Amazingly, Caesar had surgeons following his legions in the Gallic Wars. Augustus, the great Augustus who followed Caesar as the emperor of the Roman Empire, had a troop or a company of surgeons accompanying each legion into warfare. Then, surprisingly, the little knowledge that had accrued up to this point of time seemed to have been forgotten. And there came a time for many, many centuries where the soldiers were left abandoned in battle. After all, war was for the killing and medicine was for healing. But there was no medicine. That was the state of affairs. And remember, the armory of war continued to increase. There were just not arrows and spears and maces. There was now guns, there was artillery, and we come then to an important period in the history of war and medicine, which is the 15th 
16th century, 1500, when Francis of Spain decided to invade northern Italy, there was a great battle in which many, many died. Francis prevailed, but there were many, many dead. And then comes into the story a great human being. His name was Ambroise Paré. He was a barber surgeon. He joined the French army as a junior most surgeon. And he went into battle in northern Italy when France invaded northern Italy. And he was shocked at what he saw. And he asked the senior most surgeon, what do I do with these wounds, sir? And he said, you treat such wounds with either burning oil or you cauterize them with a hot iron. And he did that. But then what happened was that he suddenly found that he was short of oil. What was he to do? Perhaps you and I would have gone back to the tent and gone to sleep. But he's decided to do something else. He made his own concoction, his grandmother's concoction, of turpentine, oil of roses, and honey, mixed that together, and applied it to the wounds of those patients he had not treated. He had great fear when he went to sleep that in the morning he would find all the patients he had treated in a different way, in a very bad state. It was the other way around. It was the cauterized patients which were dreadfully ill, and it was the patients that he had treated with a simple mixture, a soothing mixture, who did, did seem to be well. From that point in time, cauterization of wounds, a cruel, cruel procedure, or using burning oil to treat wounds, was abolished. He was indeed a great man, Ambrose Perry. The great discovery that he made was the artery forceps. With the artery forceps, he could clamp for this. Many people used to die, many soldiers used to die of excessive blood loss. He would clamp the vessel and the bleeding would stop. He was a man who was not only a great surgeon, but combined himself, combined within him the qualities of a great physician. He was a healer. When a man was brought to him, related to the king in a desperate state after the battle, and the king said, please look after this man, he found this man in a desperate state, his femur smashed to smithereens, stinking, dirty clothes, being put in a very dirty bed in dirty surroundings. He changed all that. Good room, good ventilation, good clothes, good food, operated, removed all the bone fragments that were present in the femur, put on music. He couldn't sleep, the patient couldn't sleep. So he started a device whereby it would appear as if there is a constant rain, a drop, drop, drop of the rain, and that put the patient to sleep. The patient recovered. And it would be, how in the blazes did you help this man to live? And he replied in French, Je passerai et la bière du revi. This is old French, which means I dressed him and God healed him. And that is the epitaph to this great man after he died. A man who won great renown and who was the physician and surgeon to the four kings of France in his lifetime. Well, that was Ambroise Paré. Now we go on next. The next, of course, is the Crimean War. The Crimean War, the camp at Scutari with British soldiers was hopelessly filthy, wounded, badly treated. And then came Florence Nightingale, who sorted out this whole issue. So the start of good nursing and the spread of good nursing were born from the seeds of a hopelessly kept a barrack, if you like to call it, or a hospital, if you like to call it, in Scutari during the Crimean War. I'm not going to go through all the wars, but I must mention the American War of Independence and the American Civil War where many people died. And I shall explain to you later. Where for one soldier who died of battle, battle wounds, there were 10 who died without battle wounds. And I shall tell you why in due course of time. And of course, we come to the great world wars. The two great world wars, which were horrendous. Where destruction and death was meted out all over the world where 47 million people died in the First World War, 74 million people died 
in the Second World War. And medicine had to innovate, surgery had to innovate to treat the dreadful problems, the dreadful wounds, the destruction of the bodies, almost sometimes torn to pieces. They had to innovate, they had to invent so that they could meet these casualties as best as they could. They could only go a small way. It was death and destruction most of the time. The question arises that in many, many wars, death was often not due to bullet wounds but to disease. In fact, war, disease and famine stalked the earth time and again in these calamitous times, in these in those calamitous years. And there were, it is easy to understand why disease was so rife in these areas. Look at their living conditions. Absence of good clean water, poor diet, poor hygiene, cramped conditions. Places where they were camped in a horrible state. Places where they slept in a horrible state. Gastrointestinal diseases, plague, cholera, typhoid, tetanus, all of these were right. And even as in time to come, preventive measures and treatment of many of these diseases came about, still there was a great mortality. So that in these particularly, in all the wars up to the Second World War, more deaths came about as a result of disease rather than wounds. It was only the Second World War that deaths from wounds were more than those with disease. Don't forget that in the First World War, disease, the Spanish flu, which initially was thought to have killed 50 million people, but today is believed to have killed perhaps 80 to about 100 million people. So that is as it was, and perhaps one of the greatest diseases linked closely to war, right from ancient times to the present time, is typhus. Typhus is a disease produced as a result of bodies being jammed close together, filthy, unhealthy, not having been washed for a long time, living in dirt and mire, where louse carrying the typhus germs gets on to the body, bites them, passes that bug on, and you get typhus which is a calamitous disease in these conditions. It is of interest to know that the defeat of Napoleon in Russia was partly related to typhus. Typhus started to strike soon after the capture of Smolensk, rumbled on, grumbled on slowly within the army. He ultimately reached Moscow after the Battle of Borodino. Moscow was burning. He had to retreat. And it was in the five weeks of retreat that the greater part of the Grand Army was decimated by typhus. Not so much by the cold, of course that played a part. Not so much by the Cossacks, that also of course played a part. But the major factor was typhus. I'd like to say one other really interesting thing. That all this time, all this time, before the First and Second World Wars, how were wounds treated? The serious wounds could only be treated by amputation. Why? Because otherwise gangrene would set in, and that would be fatal. And a surgeon was judged not by his skill, but by his speed. I must tell you the story of the most famous amputation of all time. Even till today. It was the amputation of the arm of Horatio Nelson. He was a great man, really, if you ask me. He lost his one eye in the siege of a town, of a sea town in uh, Corsica, where a cannonball falling, falling near him spread or splashed a lot of sand into his eye, and he lost his eye. Then, at the battle close to the Canary Islands, in Tenerife, which is one of the islands, in a place, it was believed the Spanish gold had been hidden. And Nelson was ordered to find it and bring it back. He had three frigates with him. 
and one cut, a gale broke out, and there was therefore no element of surprise left. Anyone would have turned back and said, they're all waiting for us. They'll kill us if we try and get to the shore. But he decided, no, he would get to the shore. So they had rowing boats. He headed that rowing, first rowing boat. He was a rear admiral at that time. He needn't have done that, but he was at the head of that. And as soon as he was landed, he was shot with great, great, he was shot with fire. His whole hand was mutilated. He said, my hand has been shot. I think I should die. His stepson was near him. He took him to the boat, took off his handkerchief from his neck and immediately tied it as a tunicate to the arm and probably saved his life. He was taken back to his ship. They tried to help him. He said, no, I have one eye. I have one arm and I have two legs. I need no. He goes out and he tells the surgeon, quick, take my arm off, quick, quick, take it off. And there were two young lads there, one an English one and another one who was a royalist who had escaped from the French Revolution. And he was one of the other surgeons, two young lads. Can you imagine a ship rolling in the sea? Just a lamp for the surgeons to see? They cut it off. And can you believe it? It is recorded. He never said an ooh or no. I can't think of anyone who could have had this amputation in this fashion and behaved in this fashion. Yet he died, as you know, at the Battle of Trafalgar. And when he walked out to the quarters in his full medals, in his full admiral suit, and refused not to change, and he was shot by a sharp marksman from a French, French warship just 100 yards away. The bullet went through his, below his left shoulder, shattered his ribs, went through the lung, tore one of the pulmonary arteries, went into the spine, and damaged the spine. Spinal cord. He was paralyzed. He was taken down. A surgeon comes to help him. He says, Mr. Bradley, I'm done for. I've just a few hours to live. You can do nothing for me. He lived till he, lived, till he was told that the battle was won. And after that, even in his last moments, he gives the orders of how the remaining ships had to be destroyed. And then he passed away. This indeed was a great man. I thought I must tell you this interesting story. So now, I think there was another interesting story I need to tell you. This is about the Russian commander-in-chief who was against Napoleon. His name was Kutsov. He was a one-eyed man. He lost his eye in Crimea in the battle, in Crimea, a year ago. And in that very same battle, he had a wound in his head which shattered his frontal lobe. And funnily enough, it was a French surgeon at that time who took care of him and managed to sandwich him. It is believed that his tactics in war when against Napoleon were partly related to this damaged frontal lobe. He would not give battle, and it is believed that he was an extremely indecisive general. And perhaps his tactic of falling back, drawing Napoleon further in, maybe it might have been partly related to the frontal lobe damage, which made him rather indecisive and not agreeable to give battle. The only battle he gave was, of course, at the Battle of Borodino. I think it was 18, uh, 18, uh, I'll tell you, 1812. I think it was 1812. So that's another thing. And finally, it's amazing how sometimes disease was used as a weapon. For example, when there was a great plague in China, it spread to the Tartars. That was in the 14th century. And the Tartars were besieging a group of Venetians in, the, in a port in the Crimea. And they catapulted their dead plague victims on to, to these Venetians. So plague spread there. These Venetians then quickly got into their boats and tried to run away and escape. Many of them were carrying plague with them. Many of them had plague on them. They landed in Europe. And from there, that plague spread all over the world one of the greatest plagues of all time. Now comes a question which is often asked. Has medicine 
really progress in war? Did medical research progress enough so that it could be used in fields outside the battlefield, in civilian society? That was the question that was asked. Undoubtedly, yes. First, the treatment of wounds. Where could you ever have the experience that the surgeons had at that point in time? The treatment of shock, the use of fluids, the use of plasma, the use of blood. The treatment of emergencies, the seeds of emergency and critical care medicine were sown in the battlefields of the Somme and the battlefields of the World War II. What else was there? Will you believe it? The ultrasound was discovered during the war. The ultrasound was first discovered, it was used to find cracks in the armor plate of an armored vehicle, whether it was a tank or any other vehicle. It was then used for civilian work as well. The seats of all specialized medicine and surgery were born on the battlefields of the First and Second World War. Orthopedics, neurosurgery, GI surgery, surgery, thoracic surgery. You name these specialities, they were all, all there. They started most of these wars. Amazingly. All those who in the war headed and did these surgeries after the war was finished founded departments of those specialized services. And they were the founders of specialist medical and surgical systems during peacetime. It's interesting. And I think an extremely important thing was the transfusion of blood. They couldn't transfuse blood because blood was coagulated. The greatest, one of the greatest discoveries, the simplest discoveries in medicine was that if you added sodium citrate to blood, it would not coagulate. And then the storing of blood, that was a logistic problem which was beautifully met. It was beautifully met, I can't go into the organization, but that organization in the war was ultimately transferred to the civilian side to form blood banks. And now you have blood banks, and you can blood, you can get blood as and when you want. And finally, of course, finally, of course, the treatment of infection. I've given you a list of other infections, but the greatest discoveries that happened because of the war was penicillin. Fleming discovered penicillin sometime in the late 20s, 27. But his discovery was written and put in a journal and was gathering dust. It was Flory, a pathologist in Oxford, head of pathology at a very young age, Chain and Italy, who decided to look up penicillin just to see because it could destroy bacteria. It was bactericidal. And they were looking it up and they found, found Fleming's work. And they decided to try and make penicillin. But they couldn't. They could make very little, not enough. The war started, but they said we have to do it. This would be a boon to everyone. It would fight all infections. We have to. But they couldn't. So they went to the British government and they said, this is very useful. You must do something about it. Give us the money. Set up a factory. They said, no, we just don't have the money. And we are doing so many other things. So they went to America where the manufacture of penicillin was taken on an industrial scale and penicillin was available on D-Day and it saved thousands and millions of lives and it continued to save thousands and millions of lives later on. And the other thing I want to tell you is, is plastic surgery. Plastic surgery, how could you ever get the practice and experience of plastic surgery in civilian life as they did in the war. Harold Gillis in the First World War and in the Second World War in McClure, who was looking after pilots that were almost burnt, unrecognizable. 4,000 casualties burnt terribly in the Battle of Britain in the Air Force. And they required multiple surgeries, not one, but 20, 30 surgeries to set them right. So instead of plastic surgery, he called it reconstructive surgery. You could never find the civilian experience at all. And plastic surgery would have taken ages to come to what it was and what it is right now had it not been for the war. So 
when you ask the question, did medical progress really take place with the war? Of course it has. There's no doubt about that. Could it have take, taken place without the war? Would it not have taken place in peacetime, only if it would have taken a longer time? Maybe yes. But I give you two examples here, penicillin and plastic surgery. Penicillin in particular, which may not have been discovered at all, had it not been. Now I'm going to end this with a short interplay, a kind of an interplay between history, war, and medicine. The first question is already answered. Discoveries would have taken place without the war. War did produce discoveries, innovations. They would have taken place without the war, but they would have taken a long, long time, and some discoveries may not have occurred at all. But the second is an important question. What say you, if you have dreadful evil like the war, and if it produces some good, is that an ethical concept which is worth accepting, good emanating from dreadful evil. Of course, if there had been no wars, the question wouldn't arise. But war has been stitched into the genome of humankind, of humanity. William and Ariel Durand, writing in 1968, said that in 3,500 years of world history, only 265 years were without war, can you imagine? And don't forget, after the Second World War, we had the Korean War, the war in Vietnam, the war in uh, Afghanistan, in Syria, in Lebanon, in Palestine, and numerous other conflagrations all over. So war is an inescapable fact of life. Therefore, how do you reconcile this to evil producing a little good? The answer is that even in the world of today, in the lives of today, in the world of today, there are good forces and evil forces which contend against one another. Arnold Toynbee is in great agreement with that a great historian who said that the only explanation for the world today is to have evil forces and good forces contending against each other. Good is medicine, evil of course is war. So, if progress in medicine is distilled from the evil cauldron of war, philosophically, one can say that however evil evil can be, it can never suppress good absolutely and totally. And therefore, the good that emanates from that should be accepted with pleasure for the sake of 